This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. This is episode number 43 of the Homestead Journey Podcast. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I am so glad that you are joining us here on the podcast. If you are listening for the first time, I am so glad that you found this podcast, and if you have been a long-time listener, thank you so much for your support and taking time out of your busy schedule to listen to me ramble on about homesteading. My name is Brian Wells. I am coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York, and folks, I feel a little rusty (laughs) <laughs> it has been a couple of weeks since I have sat behind the microphone. Um, as you might recall from last week's episode, we had been on vacation. And so I have not done this for a few weeks. And I just feel a little bit like um, a fish out of water. And so just trying to get my head back in the game, so to speak. As I said, we were on vacation. We had a wonderful, wonderful time. We actually spent a little over, or I guess it was right out a week up in Niagara Falls area. And I should say over in the Niagara Falls area, geographically from where we are located. It's about uh, five hours, four and a half, five hours from our house to get to Niagara Falls. And it just really was a great, great week for us. I'm not going to bore you with the details of our vacation uh, and give you a play-by-play, but it really, really was a great week for us. In part, I think part of the reason why it was a great week for me in particular is because I had almost no cell phone coverage at our campsite. And even when we would go down to the Niagara Falls area, I had very random coverage. Now, my my wife and son uh, have the same carrier as I do. Their phones are, I guess, on their uh, on the list of phones or whatever, are supposedly inferior phones to the phone that I have. Although none of us have top of the line phones, but they had uh, they they could wander around our campsite and find a, a bar or two. I had no coverage whatsoever at our actual campsite. And when I would wander around the campground, every once in a while, I would find a bar or two. But it really forced me to disconnect and decompress, and it really, really was great. Now, when we would go into town and I, I would, you know, get that random coverage, I was able to have some communication with my dad and with uh, the people that were watching the homestead for us. But other than that, I did not think about the homestead or homesteading all week long. Now, that really was not my plan. I took some books with me. I actually took the Little House on the Prairie series. I had shared with you that I was reading through that, and I had gotten up to on the shores of Silver Lake. So I started there, and I read through the end of the series. By about Thursday, I think I was done with that. And my plan was to read the Encyclopedia of Country Living. And I just switched gears and said, you know what? I am going to take some more days and just not think about homesteading. And I didn't. And it was it was great. I, I just bought some random books at, at the grocery store and at Walmart and read them. As some novels. I rarely do that. I should do that more, but I don't. And... It just was a great week of of decompressing and just kind of recharging and re-energizing myself. And now here we are back and ready to rock and roll. Before we jump into this week's Homestead Happenings, I did want to give you a quick podcast update. This week, we passed 25,000 downloads of this podcast. And so thank you so much for being a part of that. I really, really greatly appreciate it. Secondly, this week I had, a, well, actually just over the last several weeks, uh, I had a number of people reach out to me asking me for some recommendations on books and on gear. 
And as you may recall, when I did my uh, did the episode with regards to processing chickens, I had set up an Amazon Associates, I think is what they call it now, account, and I had put together some links with some of the gear that we use from uh, with regards to processing chickens. Uh, I had put together some of those links in those show notes. Well, what I went ahead and did is create uh, on our website, the homesteadjourney.net slash shop. And there's a bunch of links there and I'll be adding to those uh, over the next several weeks and probably just it'll be a, an ongoing thing um, where I have recommendations to books and to some of the things that we use here on our homestead. And those are affiliate links, so if you click on those, you buy things through that, it will uh, give uh, us a, a bit of a percentage. It's not much, but uh, that will help us as we put together this podcast, help pay for the hosting and some of the gear that I have purchased. Uh, and so if you feel so inclined, I would greatly appreciate that. The homesteadjourney.net slash shop. And also... Just keep in mind, these are things that we use. I don't have a sponsorship, so I'm not being paid by anybody to hawk these, these products. These are things that we use here on the homestead and that I recommend. There are some things that we have purchased through Amazon and other retailers that just didn't work out well. And so you're not going to find those items uh, in the that, that list of, of things. But uh, the gear that you find on the homesteadjourney.net slash shop is gear that we use and that we recommend things that have worked out well for us. So check it out. I'll be updating that periodically. Uh, there are books that either we have in our library or books that I have borrowed from the library and read and found to be helpful. And uh, so again, check that out. And uh, as I said, any purchase that you make through that does help support the show. Having said that, let's jump right into this week's Homestead Happenings and I will bring you up to speed with what we've been doing here on 3B Farm and Homestead. As you can imagine, coming back from vacation, uh, even without a homestead, without a garden, I, I know for many of us, we sometimes feel like we need a vacation from our vacation. And not only that, but then we kind of feel like we're playing catch up. Well, thankfully, we plan things. And I think this is the first vacation or one of the first ones that I can ever remember where I did not over program things. And so I didn't feel like I needed a vacation from the vacation when I got home. But certainly we felt like we were behind the eight ball. And to a certain extent, I still feel that way. Uh, this week. It's just kind of taken me a little bit of time to get my head back in the game and kind of remember what I was doing and why I was doing it. Not so much why I was doing it, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> and one of the big things, obviously, this time of the year is the garden. And uh, this, as I shared in last week's episode, is certainly not the optimal time to go on vacation when you have a garden. But thankfully, things didn't come on as heavily last week as I was afraid they would. I really thought our, our tomatoes were going to come on hot and heavy last week, and they didn't. And in fact, they haven't really come on uh, as much as I thought they should have by now. And I was getting a little worried about that, but uh, we got together with my mom and dad to get some ice cream tonight, and my dad said that his tomatoes uh, haven't really started producing except for onesies and twosies here and there. And we've gotten a little better than that, so I guess maybe it's just the year. We did get enough tomatoes, though, this week so I could do my first run of dehydrating tomatoes. And if you follow us on Instagram, uh, you will have seen pictures there or on Facebook. Uh, we shared them there. Uh, if you haven't already followed us on our social media accounts, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and on YouTube. All of the links are in the show notes. I would really love it if you'd uh, give us a follow or a like. Uh, but uh, we dehydrated the tomatoes this week, and that really was a lot of fun. And in fact, I have more tomatoes, in particular uh, cherry tomatoes, in the dehydrator right now, along with some basil. Um, I have some basil that I have hanging in the kitchen that we're air drying. 
but we also had some basil that kind of got away from us and it had started to flower. And so from what I understand, when you get in that kind of situation, the best thing to do is to take the leaves off of the plant and then to kind of dry them, but not to dry the whole thing because things will start to get bitter. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, I'm a little disappointed in myself that I didn't get the basil before it started the flower, but it is what it is. This week, we also did a lot of canning. Uh, we had beans that I, I had to pick when we got back. And unfortunately, that was one of the big areas where th of things that kind of got away from us. Uh, my mom and dad did pick some of the, the vegetables while we were gone, but they just weren't able to keep up with all of the beans. And so we did uh, pick beans when we got back, but about 50% of the beans that I picked, we had to discard. They were too big. Um, now, the good thing is, is that we have the pigs, we have the chickens, uh, and so we just turn those large beans into eggs and bacon. So it's not like it's a total loss, but uh, certainly a little bit disappointing there. But we canned beans this week, and we also canned beets. I harvested the first planting of beets, and we, we did can those up last night. Now, one of the things I found with my beets is, A, I did not thin them as well as I should have. And so I had a lot of little beets instead of kind of more the beets that you would want to have. Um, and the other thing is, is that the beets that were kind of the right size, either voles or moles or chipmunks had started gnawing on them. So that really, really made processing the beets a bit of a pain in the butt because A, you were dealing with a lot of smaller beets and B, I was having to cut out a lot of chunks, which meant that Last night, I was up until 2 o'clock. Well, actually, I was up until 2 o'clock this morning. Um, uh, not really. I, I shut the canner off at midnight last night. I wanted to let the pressure go down and then pull the jars before I went to bed. Well, I sat down on the couch, and the next thing I knew, I was waking up at about 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so I went ahead and uh, opened up the canner, pulled the jars out, and then I went to bed. But uh, 17 pints of beets um to add to the the food that we're putting away and so i'm very very excited about that finally yesterday i pulled my onions and i have them curing underneath the carport some varieties did better than other my sweet onions did really really well the red onions did okay um my yellow onions didn't do so hot and the white onions well they, I don't know, they just don't look right. So I think with my white onions, what I'm going to do is peel them and run them through the dehydrator and uh, maybe make my own onion powder. Um, but I don't think they are going to be a good candidate for long-term long storage. Obviously been eating a lot of stuff from the garden. We had some beet greens. Uh, last night, I fried up some cabbage. We had actually had a cabbage that split on us while we were gone. I harvested it. Uh, I kept what I could, chopped it up real fine, fried some bacon up in a skillet, and then put that cabbage in there. And oh boy, whoo, it was some good eating. <laughs> So uh, anyhow, the garden is just doing, it's not doing awesome, but it is really starting to produce and we'll see how things uh, go over the next several weeks, uh, how things progress with regards to the tomatoes. It just kind of feels to me like we're a little bit behind where we were at last year and I really expect it to be a little bit ahead, to be honest with you, because we got some things in the ground a little bit earlier than we did last year and I put in place the drip irrigation system, but it just seems like as far as the production goes, we're just a little bit behind where we were at last year. Now, we had a bit of that deer uh, issue earlier, and I, I think that my fencing has kind of helped a little bit, but we've got something else nibbling in there, so who knows. Uh, but anyhow, overall, it's a good week from the standpoint of the garden. This week, we also had Hurricane Isaias come through, or Tropical Storm, I think, by the time it got to us. And I think we got four inches of rain in just a few hours. Um, so that was kind of good and bad. We needed the rain, but when it comes down that fast, 
the driveway starts washing out and that water has a tendency to run off and not soak in quite as well as you would like. But we've had a few other days of rain, so hopefully that will continue. And uh, anyhow, it was a busy week here on the homestead. It flew by, and yet on one hand I look back and I think, what in the world did I accomplish? And then I take a look at my notes and say, well, yeah, I did actually get some things done. (laughs) It wasn't a total wasted week. Oh, one other thing. One other thing we did this week. My son and I finally got the nesting boxes into the mobile coop. Uh, It should be about time for those pullets to start laying. So I wanted to get those nesting boxes in there. So we hung them up yesterday. And hopefully it won't be long and we will start getting those little pullet eggs that are so cute but are just a foretaste of what is to come. All right, everybody, that's this week's Homestead Happenings. Let's jump over to this week's Charting the Course. I'm entitling this episode, If I Could Do It Over Again. Now, when it comes to our homestead journey, honestly, I don't have a lot of regrets. Now, that's not to say that things have always been easy. It's not to say that things have always gone according to plan. That's certainly not the case. There have been a lot of failures along the way, but I like to look at them like Thomas Edison did when he was accused of failing, I think it was 10,000 times before he actually successfully invented the light bulb. And he said, no, I didn't fail. I simply learned 10,000 ways that don't work. You may remember back in episode 37, Brenda Scott uh, was my guest on that show. And she is in the middle of writing a book called How We Failed at Farming. And I kind of gave her a little bit of a hard time about that because I don't see what they went through as necessarily failures. If you haven't gathered this by now, that's kind of how I approach homesteading in general. I look at all of this as a big experiment. I'm trying to figure out what works for me and what doesn't work for me because what works for one person may not work for another. What works for one homestead may not work for another. And I'm good with that. I look at some of the things, if it doesn't work for me, well, I'll try something else. And if it did work for me, can I try something a little different that'll maybe work a little bit better? So for me, generally speaking, even in life in general, not even just homesteading, but in life in general, I look at failures as learning opportunities. What can I take away from this so that I don't make the same mistake in the future? For me, it's generally not a matter of I wish I could go back and do things differently because those flaws, those imperfections, those mistakes, those times when things didn't go necessarily according to plan, those are all things that have brought me to where I am today. They've made me who I am today. They're building blocks for the future, so to speak. Now, I know not everybody shares that perspective, but that really is my perspective, not just with homesteading, but with life in general. But there are a few things, a handful of things. Now, I'm very, very blessed that it's only a handful of things, but there are a few things that come to my mind that I really do wish that I could go back in time and do over. I wish I had that transmogrifier that... uh, Calvin had from Calvin and Hobbes, that box where I could get in and pull a lever and go back and do a few things a bit differently. And I guess kind of the way that I delineate this in my mind is there are certain things I've made mistakes. Okay, I know what not to do in the future. I know I need to apply something, uh, maybe a, a little bit of a different approach in the future. But there are some things that you just, you can't, you can't, you don't get a second chance at it. Either the time has passed or you've kind of picked a horse and now you've got to ride it. And without a significant level of either capital investment or physical labor, um, you've you've charted the course. (laughs) And now you've got to go that direction. And so I don't necessarily share these things with you on this episode because I'm beating myself up. Because I'm not. There's this quote from Catherine Mansfield who was an author who was born in New Zealand in the late 1800s, 
with regards to regret that I really, really like. She said this, make it a rule of life never to regret and never to look back. Regret is an appalling waste of energy. You can't build on it. It's only good for wallowing in. Now, I certainly agree with her that regret is an appalling waste of energy. But I think there are times when we look back at the things and we say, well, I wish I would have done things differently. And maybe we don't have the opportunity to go back and do things differently. We can share those lessons with other people and hopefully they can avoid making the same mistakes that we have made. And so that's my hope with this episode. Uh, Maybe some of these things don't apply to you. But these were kind of the six things that came to my mind with regard regards to the regrets that I have with our homestead and the things that I wish I could go back and do differently. These are in no particular order, although the last two would probably be my two biggest regrets. So let's just jump right into it. First of all, I wish I would have planted fruit trees and berries a long, long, long time ago. (laughs) In fact, uh, back earlier this year, I shared with you how I was out planting the apple trees and my son was excited that I was finally getting around to planting apple trees. And he said, Dad, how soon will we have apples? And I said, well, son, probably four to five years. And his face kind of fell and he said, but Dad, at that point, I'm going to be in college. He said, if you would have just listened to me and planted trees Seven years ago or 10 years ago, when I wanted to plant trees, we'd be enjoying apples by now. (laughs) Well, he's right. The old adage is the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time to plant a tree is now. And so certainly I do wish that I had planted fruits and berries a long time ago because we would be realizing that harvest now. So that certainly is one of my big regrets. I can't go back. I can't get those years back. I can certainly uh, plant the tree today and I have done that. But uh, obviously for me to be able to achieve that harvest is now going to be four or five years down the road where if I would have, well, if I would have listened to my son, (laughs) I would be enjoying that harvest today. Another big regret that I have is that I put my raised beds too close together. And this is something that I I guess I guess in theory I could tear all of my raised bed gardens apart and I could spread things out a little bit further, but it would require a significant amount of energy, a significant amount of um, uh, probably finances to redesign and rebuild my raised bed gardens. In some cases, I have them 18 inches apart. And when you've got tomatoes growing up a trellis, that starts creeping out into that 18 inches. And then you turn around and the next thing you know, you're tripping over the garden bed behind you. (laughs) That's not very fun. And so I am always reminded this time of the year when things are really starting to fill up in that garden, of that regret. I really, really wish I would have spaced my garden beds farther apart. Along with that, I wish I would have built my garden beds only three feet wide. Now, in theory, with the uh, raised bed garden system that I use, square foot gardenings, the reason why they build them or recommend that you build them four feet wide is because the average person can comfortably reach out two feet from themselves. So if you can go from one side, you reach in two feet, great. You go to the other side, you reach in two feet, everybody's happy. However, I have a tendency to plant on the north side of my my beds and my beds run east-west. On the north side of my beds, I have a tendency to plant my tall things like my tomatoes, my peppers, my peas, not, not, not peppers, my tomatoes, my peas, my cucumbers, things that are on a trellis. Well, when you do that, now you don't have the opportunity from that side of your bed to reach in two feet. So now anything that you planted on the other side in that three feet, it's very difficult to reach that third foot that's in there. So I really wish that I would have only built my raised beds three feet wide because then on the north side, I would have my tall crops, my tomatoes, my pole beans, 
my cucumbers, things like that, that I'm growing up a trellis. And then on the other side, I would be able to comfortably reach those two feet. And one thing is for sure, I'm not getting any younger. I'm not getting any more flexible. And so where a few years ago, I could kind of stretch out to reach that third foot. My center of gravity has changed a little bit. <laughs> and so reaching that third foot is not quite as easy as it was. And so I wish I would have built my raised beds three foot wide instead of four foot wide. I've also shared this with you before, but I wish I would have spent more time thinking about aesthetics here on the homestead. I have shared with you before that my focus has been on function over form. I didn't care how it looked. I wanted it to function in a particular way. I really didn't focus on growing flowers because I was focused on growing food. I didn't worry about making things look pretty. I just wanted it to work. And if it looked a little ugly, well, so be it. And while I have this year really put a concerted effort into trying to make things look pretty, so to speak, there are a lot of things, a lot of catching up that I have to do. And I really wish I would have paid more attention to aesthetics. The next thing I wish I would have done is involve my son in more projects. I periodically have had him help me with certain things, but sometimes I just get my head down and I'm focused on, I want to get X, Y, Z done and so I just jump into it and, well, I don't necessarily involve my son as much as I should have. And when I look back on some of the things that we have done and when I've involved my son, yeah, maybe it's taken a little bit longer to do it. But when I look back on it and I think about it, it really brings a smile to my face. And then I think about the projects where I didn't involve him and maybe I could have and maybe I should have. And there certainly is a level of regret that I have there. There are certain things that he doesn't know how to do because I've not showed him how to do that. And at this age, when you've got a 16-year-old, almost 16-year-old, there's a certain sense to where you just can't get that time back. And so I certainly do have a bit of regret there where I wish I would have involved my son in more projects and maybe showing him how to do certain things, um, and, and I didn't. And so if you're someone who has young kids, yes, it's going to take a little bit longer to get the projects done, but I think in the long run, if you involve your kids in doing it, you'll be a lot better off when you're sitting where I'm sitting. <laughs> Finally, my biggest regret when it comes to homesteading is that I did not take the time to sit down and interview and record the interviews with my grandfather. My grandfather is someone who was involved in raising and growing food his entire life. The entire time that I can remember him living here in Greenwich, he had a very large garden. He raised chickens. At some points, he was raising pigs and I think even a goat or a sheep and some turkeys and some ducks and just a lot of things like that. Um, and, and I just remember that my entire life. And I had always hoped to sit down and talk to him about that, really to interview him and to record those interviews. And it was one of those things that it was on my to-do list and I just never got around to doing it. Now my grandfather has it's been six years since he passed. And obviously I can't go back and I, I can't go back and do that. I can't do that today. I can't do it tomorrow. Um, and I really, really wish that is one of my biggest regrets is that I did not take the time to to have those conversations and to learn as much as I could from him with regards to gardening and with regards to animal husbandry and, and all of those kinds of things. I just didn't take the time to do that. And I really wish that I, that I would have. And so if you have someone that kind of serves as a mentor to you, you have a grandparent that has been a grandfather, grandmother, uh, someone who's a close family friend that has kind of been a mentor to you in these areas 
I really, really would strongly recommend that you just sit down with them. And whether you record the interviews or not, it's up to you. But really pick their brains and ask them questions and learn as much as you can from them. Because there's going to come a time, there's going to come a day when that that window of opportunity is going to be closed. And when that window of opportunity closes, it's closed forever. No, I don't know. Maybe this is a bit of a downer of a topic for a homesteading podcast. I'm very blessed, as I said, that there's really only these six things that have come to my mind as far as true regrets, things that I wish that I could do over again. Now, certainly, again, as I said, I could take my raised beds apart and move them. And perhaps in the future, what I'll do is combine regret two and regret three and By building or rebuilding the beds into three foot wide beds, I'll get an extra foot of space between my beds and everything will be (laughs) hunky-dory. But obviously some of the things like the planting of the fruits and berries, yes, I can plant those, but I can't get the time back. And I certainly uh, can't get the time back with my son and my grandfather. And I don't say those things because I'm wallowing in this. I don't. It's just, it is what it is. If wishes were horses, beggars would ride, as they say. Um, But hopefully you can learn from these things and at least not make the same mistakes that I have made. What are some of your biggest regrets? I'd love to hear from you, Brian, at thehomesteadjourney.net, or you can reach me on Facebook. You can reach me on Instagram, uh, and I would love to hear from you. And we can talk about it and maybe we can learn from each other and I can learn from your mistakes and you can learn from mine and we'll make other mistakes, but we won't make those same mistakes. (laughs) All right, everybody, that's it for this episode. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast provider, Apple, Stitcher, Google, Spotify, etc. And while you're there, Leave us a review on iTunes or a thumbs up or whatever your podcast provider allows. That will help other people find the show. And not only that, but it helps serve as an encouragement to me. Now, if you'd really like to support the show, there are a number of ways you can do so. First of all, share the show with other people that you think might benefit from it. Secondly, you can also subscribe to all of our social media accounts on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And in particular, as we get those YouTube numbers up, what I'd like to do is some live uh, YouTube shows from around various parts of the homestead, but you can't do that until you have a thousand subscribers. And so if you can help me get those subscriber numbers up, I'd really appreciate it. Uh, And finally, don't forget that you can shop using the links on our website, thehomesteadjourney.net slash shop. Those are affiliate links and we earn a small commission from each item that is sold. The music on this episode, as always, has been provided by audionautics.com. So a big shout out to them. And until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.